Hi there, and welcome to the Paula Fiscal Show. For those of you that are on YouTube, you can also pull this show up by putting in the Paula Fiscal Show. This show airs on Channel 29 at 3 o'clock p.m. every Sunday. And for those of you that are social media experts, we would like you to begin to use your Twitter account every time you see us online. My Twitter account is at Paula C. Fiscal. Welcome. We have a very special guest today, particularly in light of the fact that our President Obama has said that it is now very, very crucial that we open up the borders with Cuba. So our first guest is going to be Greg Candelario, who is a chemist from Cuba. He has a degree from the University of Havana, and he also happens to be the owner of Adams Labs in Sacramento. Greg is responsible for doing testing of asbestos, lead, and also mold in residences and in commercial buildings. So to begin with, we're going to welcome Greg, and if you can tell us a little bit about your background and where you went to school, and how long you've been in the United States, we welcome you to the show. Thank you. Um, well, I came to the United States in the late 90s, uh, exactly November 1995, uh, directly from Cuba. And um, I studied, like you say, in the University of Havana. I got a degree in chemistry. And uh, I got my first job in San Diego uh, during the time that I was looking for any kind of job. And I was lucky enough that I found this environmental lab that were looking for a chemist, precisely what I studied. Desperately looking for a chemist, and I was desperately looking for a job. So it was a perfect combination, and I got my first job in the field of environmental related science, asbestos, mold, indoor air quality, and uh, lead in general. And how old were you then? And did you come directly from Cuba with your family, or did you get married here? How, how did that come about? Uh, I was 33 years old at that time. Uh, I came by myself with a K-1 visa, fiancé visa. And uh, that's how I ended up in the beautiful city of San Diego. So tell me a little bit about that K-1 visa. K-1 visa is uh, a type of visa that has been around for a while. I did not know at that time for, uh, I would say, um, foreigners uh, when they get engaged or they have a relationship with a, a U.S. citizen. And it's a, one of the multiple ways to apply to come to the United States for a certain amount of time. I believe it's 90 days. And then after that, you have to follow some immigration process. Uh, as part of that, you're supposed to get married Otherwise, you have to go back to your homeland. Uh huh. So, for those of you that are considering bringing over some important people from Cuba, that would be the first step. Okay, now let us get back to some of the backgrounds and certifications that you had to get in order to become an asbestos expert. Uh, good question. Well, uh, with my degree from Cuba, the first thing that I needed to do was to get the U.S. credential to my degree in order to be able to work in my field. Uh, once I did that, uh, I started working at this lab, and uh, my employer, great guy, uh, sent me to most of the schools where you get the training and the certification to work in lab, to do lab work and field work. I went to a couple of schools in Chicago. I got trained in uh, atomic, atomic absorption and spectroscopy. That's a very specific field that allows you to analyze heavy metal in sample. And then right after that, I became uh, you know, asbestos certified and lead inspector assessor uh, after a few years working in, in my field. And in your resume, it said you also had a, a, a some type of a program with the Russians? Well, that, that goes back to my days in Cuba. Um, when it was okay for Cubans to work with Russians. <laughs> yeah, I worked in the, 
in some kind of a, I would say in the military industry or paramilitary industry in my field as a chemist, in electroplating, uh, uh, doing uh, work um, in the repairing equipment. And during that time, a lot of Russians were our specialists, our expert, and I worked with them in the electrochemistry in particular. And in the military for Cuba, you also did a bit of work in chemical warfare? That was for about a year uh, as a lieutenant. That was right after I got out of college. In Cuba, when you get out of college, uh, you do about two years of social service as part of the payment for your free education. And I was assigned for about six months as a lieutenant working in a, in, in a military facility. So that's a really interesting social adaptation that uh, one would have in the United States because when one gets the degree that you work so hard to earn, you don't have to go and work for the government. So this is something that's just exclusive to Cuba, right? I believe so, oh, maybe to Cuba and some of the former Eastern Bloc countries that no longer exist. It, there's probably some similarity between Cuba and countries like Poland, or Hungary, Romania, some of the countries on the Eastern Bloc that are no longer uh, like socialist countries. So tell us a little bit about your family, and uh, you said earlier that you come from a, a large family of, of eight siblings, and that uh, you have the same name as your father and the same name as your grandfather, which is something very typical among Latinos as a Mexican-American. I'll tell you, I have the same name as my mother. <laughs> so give us a little bit of the background on your family. Well, I'm a, from a family of eight kids, uh, five girls and three boys. Four sisters older than I am, and then I was the first boy. That's why I have the name of my father, Gregorio Candelario. Then there are two more brothers, and then one last sister. And my two brothers, they happen to live also in the United States. They live in San Antonio, Texas. And they my birth town. <laughs> yes, you mentioned that to me. And then I ended up here in California because of my, uh, my K-1 visa. Wonderful, wonderful. And your wife, I understand, is a teacher? What does she teach? Yeah, uh, my wife is from California. She was born around here, Berkeley. Uh, we live in Sacramento. She teach uh, precisely Spanish at a high school in Davis, the city of Davis, in the Sacramento area. And we have two kids. And with your two children and your wife in, in Sacramento, you have your business, which is called Adam's Lab. Could you tell us a little bit about how you started in the business? Yeah, after a few years working in San Diego in a similar company, uh, another environmental consulting firm, uh, my partner and I moved to the Northern Park to Sacramento, and about 11 years ago we opened our own business. Uh, it's pretty much doing the same thing that we were doing before, uh, field work and lab work, uh, asbestos, fungus spore, mold, and lead related type of work. We do testing, again, we do the sample collection, the field work, and we do the lab work, and we provide report um, to all our clients, mainly in residential and commercial. Okay. <laughs> and, and so, in uh, doing the work that you do for clients, when you discover that there is asbestos, you were telling me earlier a little bit about how uh, asbestos was widely used in buildings, for example, in, in this area. Uh, can you give us a little bit of the reasons why we were using asbestos so highly? Correct. Uh, asbestos is known for many, many years. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, uh, it's been known since uh, the Greeks and the Romans, I'm talking about 500 BC. But it wasn't until the 1800 that uh, a large deposit was uh, discovered around Canada that it became more well known and more popular. Uh, nowadays, there are thousands of uh, asbestos uh, containing material in the construction industry. Um, around years, uh, around the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, it was very popular. Again, it's commonly found in, in a very large number of, number of materials. 
and it was very popular. It was a piece of great material. It is called, in fact, the word asbestos comes from a Greek word that means inextinguishable. Um, it is a gray uh, fireproof material, a gray um, insulator. It was used in the all kinds of insulation material, surfacing material, and a large variety of other uh, component uh, in the construction industry. So, Greg, I also understand that you happen to be also an author. You have written your own book. It's a biography. And for those of you that are interested in getting the book, there is an ISBN, so it is listed under UNTAL. Can you tell us and the viewers exactly how long it took you to write this book, why you wrote it, and also when you're going to translate it into English? Well, the idea of the book uh, came, uh, the idea of the book was just my own idea. You know how around December everybody uh, everybody decided to have New Year resolution. About four or five years ago, my New Year resolution was uh, to become a better driver and <laughs> to write a book. It, it, uh, I did write it in a very short period of time. That's why I need to uh, work in some grammar correction. I need to add a few more pages. But I decided that I wanted to write it, and I wrote it. It was mainly for my wife and kids. It is written in my, in my, um, in my own tongue, in my mother tongue, tongue. <laughs> in my, in my mother tongue, <laughs> in Spanish. Uh, again, it took me less than six months to write it, uh, and it's basically a memoir or autobiography that covers a big, a big part of my life and now my entire life. And when you wrote this book, your children were how old, and did they appreciate this labor of love? Yeah, when I wrote the book, my kids were, my daughter Sophia was about four years old, and my son David was about two. They are two years apart. Uh, they loved the book. Uh, I insist that they need to improve their Spanish in order to be able to understand, to fully understand this book. That's one of my main goals. And in this book, you also went into some of the governmental relations in Cuba and how uh, you worked with uh, Mr. Martin. Very briefly in my book, I talk about you know, uh, my school and uh, how I went to boarding school at a very early age. Uh, remember, I'm talking about the time of the Cold War. We were very heavily adoctrinated. Is that the right word? I, I don't like to use this kind of word. Uh, but uh, you know, politics was part of our life, and uh, the relationship between Cuba and the United States absolutely was uh, a key element of our education. And I uh, briefly talk about those days and uh, my school, my education, some of my uh, professors, etc. Which gives us a segue into our next question, which we're all very excited about. As I said earlier, uh, you are our Cuban chemist, and with the new administration of uh, Obama's making it quite possible for us to cross borders back and forth. We're going to do imports and exports and do all kinds of cross-cultural communications. And you have just come back from Cuba. Can you tell us what the level of excitement is over there? Well, I think that there is a, a great level of excitement. Um, I totally agree with uh, President Obama when he said that if we have tried uh, a formula for 50 years that did not bring any good result, why not to try to do something else? So uh, there is uh, this major idea of opening, opening relations, changing relations with Cuba. Uh, people back home are very excited about it. They, uh, everybody's talking about it on the street, and uh, it's absolutely welcome. Uh, we want change. We want change for the best. And do you have any recommendations or tips that you can give someone that's trying to work with Cuba? Uh, if I have to give any recommendation, uh, I would say uh, go down there. First we have to get on the plane. Okay. Exactly. Go down there, get your own opinion, uh, talk to people from Cuba, do your own homework, do your own reading, but the best thing to do is to actually go to the island, talk to people, uh, and 
and see what's really going on and um, see for yourself. Well, for those of us that can't afford to hop on a plane, or we don't happen to have a, 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 a jet on the side, uh, is there any particular method or way? Are there clubs? Are there organizations that uh, we can join? Well, I can tell you that on, on NPR, National Poverty Radio, they are always talking about all these different ways to, uh, to go to Cuba. Uh, as far as I know, there's only, up to this day, there's only one flight that go from Miami, that leave from Miami two, three times a day, I believe. Uh, but there are some doors opening little by little. And um, again, uh, go to NPR and get more information. Uh, I have chosen different ways because I have, since I have my family and I have my mother, uh, that is uh, 83 years old, and I have always been able to go. And, and I, most of the time I go through Miami or through Mexico, but I think that we have different venues now to go. So do you think then that primarily the area of exchange will start with tourism? Oh, absolutely. Uh, tourism is becoming our, the main industry for Cuba. Mm -hmm. It's no longer the Cuba cane process. And um, I would uh, strongly recommend to go as a tourist. As a tourist. And then what about the Cuban cigars? Are, is that going to go lower in price? Hopefully, uh, <laughs> it is, uh, you know, one Cuban's main commodity. And, and it still is. And still is. And it will continue to be. Uh, and it will continue to be. But this time we won't have to smuggle in the Cuban cigars. We'll be able to buy them right outright. No, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Well, Greg, I want to thank you for joining us on our show today. And uh, I wanted to just ask you a couple of political questions, if you don't mind. And, uh, of course, we welcome you on this show. The first question I have that's, that's uh, primarily hard-hitting is that have you run into what I would say, have you run into any discrimination because you are Cuban? Have you run into any issues with government regulations or federal regulations that have impeded your, your um, functioning as a Cuban in the United States? For the most part, I have not. Uh, discrimination may be very subtle, and it's part of our life, but uh, I have to admit that have been, uh, my life here in the United States very good. And I have not been victim of any uh, direct form of discrimination. I've been able to conduct my business. Uh, again, I was able to get my credential for my education to get all the necessary uh, certification and training um, and uh, for that reason I have nothing to complain. Well that's very good news. I'm glad to hear that. Now one more question and this has to do with our court systems and, and how we handle um, asbestos cases and what's been going on in the industry just a, a, a little bit. Um, in San Francisco, I understand that there's an asbestos board and that one of the reasons that they developed this asbestos board was because when, because we're voters, we get called in <coughs> to be on uh, civil juries. 45% of the juries were taken up with, in particular, asbestos cases. So my question to you is, do you believe or do you feel that the court system handles the asbestos cases according to your level of expertise in a, in a um, expeditious manner? Uh, like you mentioned, this is not my area of expertise. From what I know, I understand that there are uh, a significant number of cases uh, of uh, asbestos exposure related diseases. And as you know, the three main uh, diseases are asbestosis, mesothelioma, and lung cancer. And um, we see all the time on television um, some uh, advertisement about uh, people that have been directly exposed or have some symptoms of asbestos-related diseases and the process that they need to follow. Uh, how slow it is, I don't know. Uh, I understand that there is uh, some fund dedicated for those cases. Uh, 
But it's probably a slow process like any court. Any court system. Any court system. Well, let's go back then a little bit to how your company functions. You get a phone call, you come in, you uh, do an analysis, you do a report, you, you send all the materials to a particular lab. It's kind of like getting blood work. Correct. The way, <laughs> the way it works, um, we work with the insurance company, home insurance company, developers, builders, city, county, when they have cases of either fire, water mm -hmm. damage, uh, demolition, reconstruction, in building that they have the potential for having uh, asbestos or lead in pain or more, they call consulting firms like our company. So what we do, uh, we get all the information necessary and then uh, we go to the site to these sites, uh, building homes, and uh, we do what we call a survey or an investigation. It's nothing but uh, collecting all the necessary sample in order to identify, in this case, presence of asbestos. As we know, asbestos contain materials are, materials that contain asbestos, 1% uh, or greater, by the way, um, we collect sample. Samples are sum sum uh, submitted to the lab, to my own lab. We do the lab work and the field work, and we do a microscopic analysis in order to determine uh, concentration, presence of asbestos, and what type of asbestos. That report goes to the insurance company, goes to the abatement company, and they proceed based on the findings of the lab. And then do you also do uh, reporting to the EPA or to some other state or federal regulation? After we provide the report to the cities, uh, to our client, to the counties, to uh, the abatement company, there is a procedure, and as part of this procedure, the city, EPA, or OSHA receive a copy of our report, of my report. So they'll be receiving that report whether we send it to them or not? I believe so. Okay, so that's part of the process then that uh, you need to go through to once you start getting these asbestos reports and asbestos surveys and testing and things like that. So what would happen then if a, um, for example, a construction company just went in and started demolition and found that there was asbestos? What happens then? It is not very common the case. Um, most of the time, prior to any work, to any demolition, to any work, an asbestos survey is conducted by a certified asbestos consultant. And uh, it is after that report is submitted or provided that a construction company or a demolition company can do the work. And based on that information, they have to follow the procedure. In fact, in order to work in any building that contains asbestos, you uh, have to be certified. You have to have an OSHA ID or DASH and uh, with uh, proper personnel, they're supposed to be properly trained, use all the equipment, and follow all the rules and regulations established by EPA and OSHA. So then the actual process could take a couple of days, could take a couple of weeks, could take a, a certain amount of time. And I also understand from reading that if something's friable or not friable, there might be five days notice or there might be 10 days notice. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Correct, there is a process of notification that is based on the size of the job, basically in square footage, and the type of asbestos identified. And that's where the word friable or non-friable apply. Friable asbestos are more dangerous because they can release those fibers in the air easily. Uh, friability is defined by uh, when uh, an asbestos containing material becomes airborne by hand pressure when it's dry. And this when it becomes more dangerous. Keep in mind, asbestos become dangerous when fibers are released in the air at a high level. Uh, there is a PEL established by OSHA, and when those numbers are above the PEL, it becomes absolutely more dangerous. And how about uh, telling us a little bit about the lead contamination? How does that uh, process work? Uh, lead is another key element. Lead was also very popular prior to, I would say, 1979, and it was mainly used in, in paint uh, as an 
another great component. It would be, it, it, in those days, lead uh, paint that contained lead were considered better because they were more resistant, the adherency was better, uh, uh, more, uh, um, um, more resistant to heat, more resistant to weather, to environmental conditions. Uh, once we, uh, we recognized that lead was uh, not good for humans, then we stopped using lead. Uh, when the and then how about telling us just a, a sentence or so on the mold testing that you do? Well, as part of the indoor air quality or the air quality studies that we do, uh, places where they have had uh, either history of water intrusion or water damage, we do know that mold can occur. Uh, for mold, it, in order to grow, we need uh, three main components, the right temperature, the right amount of moisture, and the nutrients. The nutrients are nothing but cellulose, and cellulose is everywhere. Cellulose is wood, it's paper. Okay, so there you have it. We want to thank our guests for today, Mr. Gregorio Candelario. And if you have any questions regarding asbestos, mold, lead, certification, Greg is our expert. And if you'd like to reach him, Greg, can you give us an email or a phone number where someone can contact you? Uh, our phone number is 916-979-9250. Uh, if you need our email address, is info, I-N-F-O, at adamlabs.com. Just in case you're interested in having him come and talk about his work for career day, or anything like that. Now remember to use the Twitter account at Policy Fiscal. And also watch our show on Sundays at 3 o'clock p.m. And log on to YouTube, put in the Policy Fiscal show, and you will get to see the series of all of our shows. So thank you so much for joining us. And please, keep informed. And that's the motto of our show. So thank you again, Gregory, for joining us today. Don't worry,